Uh, welcome all to the uh, webinar for getting started with InnoSlate 3.0. I'm Steve Dam. I'm the president of Spec Innovations. Um, my PhD, in case you're wondering, is in physics. And uh, the ESEP, if you're not familiar with that, is the NCOSI certification for expert systems engineering professional. Um, that's a designation that's being used, uh, certification that's being used across the industry now. So uh, without further ado, let me just say a few opening words and then I'm going to get right into the slides. Um, if those of you who are familiar with InnoSlate 2.0 will notice some significant changes here in 3.0. Uh, over 100 new features were added or modified and updated in, in the tool. And so we're going to give you a sampling of that today, kind of give you the big picture, and then we're going to have subsequent we webinars with more details. So, so be, be aware of those as well. And if you have specific topics of interest, uh, please email us and let us know so we can go ahead and, and schedule webinars in that er subject area. So, uh, you know, I've got to put the bottom line up front. Why do you need InnoSlate? Uh, the, the, basically, the tool environment has been fragmented. Uh, many vendors, uh, each specializing in, in their certain area of the life cycle, uh, as, a, as a systems engineer, that frustrated me because um, I, I was spending some more time feeding data back and forth between tools than I was actually seeming to get any work done. <laughs> so I thought that was one thing that needed to be changed. Uh, another was the whole limited collaboration. Uh, you know, I'm always, we're always working in a team and to work in a desktop environment where I can work my piece and then I have to now integrate it and import, export it to somebody else's is quite painful. Uh, even the client server uh, capabilities that are out there are limited in that capability. Uh, there's also limited scalability. Uh, we worked very, very large projects, uh, future combat systems for the Army, uh, Constellation at NASA. So very big projects and with hundreds and hundreds of people in, in them. And, and you need to be, have some level of collaboration capability or scalability to those kind of problems. And of course, um, when you add up all the tools you need, it starts getting pretty expensive. So that's another thing we, we looked at for InnoSlate. So what makes InnoSlate different to, is that it is a single solution. We are trying to be at that top layer of the life cycle, working through all the systems engineering activities. We're not trying to do design engineering with it. That's what we're going to call vertical integration, if you hear me use that term sometimes. And we're starting to make those linkages to other products through uh, mechanisms like OSLC. Uh, if you're familiar with that, 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 that's a standard out there today that a uh, number, of, number of companies are adopting. So um, the other thing is this integrated collaboration. We really spent a lot of time in 3.0 updating the collaboration capabilities, giving you live status, every view. You can go through any view and see the live status. Uh, there's a project dashboard. Uh, there's chat, there's version control, and, and much, much more. Uh, so, so, and again, it is designed to scale to very large projects using cloud technology. And cloud computing is here. Uh, whether you're on a public cloud or a private cloud, uh, it's happening all throughout the, 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 the industry. Uh, so uh, if you're not familiar with that, uh, come talk to us. We'll be glad to give you some more information about that. Um, one of the nice things about that technology is means I can be platform independent. I no longer have to care what operating system I'm working on as long as I have a modern web browser. And I'm sorry, a modern web browser for you Internet Explorer guys or is actually I think 11 is the current version. <laughs> I, I heard the other day some company said that they've standardized on eight. So anyway, that, that's a problem. Uh, but most times the workaround is get Mozilla Firefox. That's almost allowed anywhere. Uh, I've certainly everywhere I've been in the government, uh, that's, that is an acceptable alternative browser. Uh, but Chrome is of course preferred and we, rep, we, we suggest you use Chrome at, at, at wherever you can. Uh, also note, because of this, there's no downloads. You get to go try it right on, online Play with it all to your heart's content, and then decide if it's the tool for you or not. 
Uh, hopefully it is. <laughs> uh, anyway, in a slight security, one of the things that everybody talks about the cloud and they're all worried about the cloud, and I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I've been in the business where uh, security is extremely important for many, for all my life. And um, it, it, it becomes uh, something of, it was high security, high concern to me when we were working in the cloud. And so I, I spent a lot of time researching, particularly the cloud environment we're using, which is Google, uh, and their security is top rate. Uh, and I think they'll get to the, they'll get a FedRAMP certification before they know it because they have these other certifications, the ISO, the SAS. So these are all ones that are for financial data. And so they're, they're as concerned about that as anything else. But we do some more. We add some more. We do SSL encryption in transit. So that way you have secure, that's secure socket layer, which is providing that, so you're in transit security is taken care of. Um, Google just updated so that all their files at rest are encrypted as well. So if you're really concerned about security, this, this works already out of the box on the cloud. Now, if you can't be on the public cloud, which is very common, uh, and we have a number of deployments uh, on private clouds or behind firewalls in a client server-ish environment, um, then, then you can go ahead and uh, get our on, on-site version as well. So that's, that's, again, if you're confused between the two, uh, just you know, give us a call. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of run through some slides first and then I'll show you the tool because this, this will kind of hopefully reinforce the slides. Um, signing up is pretty much the same way we had before. A little bit different is that you come up with a dashboard and you're gonna see the dashboard pop up. And then with that, there's the menu bar has changed significantly. And you can go through and see the number of options like your import analyzer. And you can even pin that now to the toolbar. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to say something. Uh, all questions will be answered at the end of the seminar. Again, we're recording this so other people can hear it. Um, so anyway, um, so anyway, so uh, as we go through uh, the dashboard, I'll show you a little bit more about that. There's there's several different things about getting started. If you're only interested in functional analysis or architecture, one phase of the life cycle, you can select that as a getting started piece, and it'll give you links to things. Uh, diagrams to uh, templates, uh, help packages, all kinds of things will help you, uh, you know, work in that area. Or you can select full lifecycle management to look at the whole set of things we support across the lifecycle. Uh, this was meant to be a, a better quick start than what we had in version two. Um, another thing you get is recent notifications. If you look on the left part of this panel, uh, lower left is the recent notifications. And what that does is show what, who changed what when. And that, that really is very helpful to, when you're trying to manage your, your project, uh, your, your, your whatever it is across the life cycle. Uh, and on the right, you notice the colored, the pretty colored thing. That's statistics. That shows you how many entities you have of what type. If when you hover over that, you get the numbers and you get the specific type of a class that, that the entity is stored in. Uh, moving on, uh, import, again, imports pretty much the same way it was before, but again, it's hidden, if you, it kind of hidden perhaps from what we saw in 2.0. It's in the menu bar and you have to select it. Again, if you're gonna do a lot of imports, put, pin it up on the top of the dashboard. Um, so, so, so next thing, once you've imported a document, again, one button import, for those who are not familiar with it, uh, we, we take docx and various CSV files. Uh, we even take in Microsoft Project and KML, which is the, uh, uh, the uh, geospatial information. So once you bring in a requirements document, you're gonna co be put into the requirements view and you can, it, it automatically reads the requirement that's there, the information that's in it, looks for key words, and determines whether it's a requirement or a statement. A state, the difference is the statement uh, it provides the context for the requirements, but they're not things you want to trace as a requirement downstream. So that's, that's there and that's still there and working very well. 
Um, then next thing you would be doing is probably building an action diagram. Uh, and if you'll notice, there's some new things on that action diagram. There's um, a, a, a hexagram which has the uh, in purple. And what those are is the resources. So one of the things we did was visualize the resource modeling explicitly now. Another thing you can do with this is when you have parallel branches, you can allocate assets to that branch as well. That will actually automatically, once you do that, you drag it over, it will automatically do it for, uh, it will take that action and associate it with the asset. Okay, so this, this is a, a really nice way to tie together your physical and functional models. Again, it's uh, all drag and drop capable. It's been, it's been completely redone, by the way. Uh, so it's a it's it's almost a new new version of the tool. So if you've had a little frustration in the past with the action diagram, I think we've resolved any of those kind of issues. Um, anyway, executable of uh, both discrete and event and Monte Carlo simulators. In case you forgot, that's that's where we really I uh, think we excel. We have an incredible way to pull together that data with automatic cost curves and uh, other information. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people wanted pretty badly was the sequence diagram. And we, we totally agreed with it. And, and one of the hard parts about developing one of these kind of diagrams is, is it's not just a picture. It has to tie together with the action diagram. So you can go from this to the action diagram or back to, from, the action di from this to the action diagram. So back and forth is, is perfectly fine. Every one of the diagrams now are drag and drop capable with sidebars to, to click on. You can click and get information about what those entities are in the database. Uh, one of our big design changes that we did between two and three is try to do as much as you can in the diagrams, making them easy, but still tie together with the database. So I think you'll, you'll, be, you'll like some of those changes. Uh, another thing, if you haven't seen our, our IDEF zero diagram, again, it's enhanced significantly. Uh, it's been, it's, it, it, you can see the new sidebar. There's also an ICOM uh, version available, so you can see the higher level. I think it's called the A0 usually in IDEF world. So we still have, we still have that going. Uh, then, of course, the simulation I mentioned earlier briefly with both that discrete event and Monte Carlo. Uh, the discrete event shows the time as a timeline very similar to a Gantt chart. Uh, that We picked that format, in case you don't know, because we wanted to have something to go to management with so they could see easily uh, what the process outputs and things like that were, and they'd, they'd feel comfortable with that output. Uh, that also has uh, tabs for charts, which is includes your cost curves. And now resource modeling shows up at the top of that as well. So you see the resources actually with the Gantt chart. Um, again, Monte Carlo is, is, has both cost and, um, and resources charts as well associated with it, as well as the time chart you're seeing. Uh, asset diagram. So the asset diagram is still pretty much the same diagram with a few twists to it. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, if you can create a block diagram or with any asset, any actually any uh, entity within the database, you can add a picture to it. So when a picture's been associated with it, it goes ahead and puts it in the place for it. So you can go from your block diagram kind of look to a, something a little prettier. Uh, in the DODAF world, we call that an OV1. Uh, also with the, the asset diagram, we just added the ability to add backgrounds. So now if you want to make it a really pretty picture, uh, very similar to what you do in, in a Visio or a, or a PowerPoint, uh, you can do that here and have it in the database. So that, that's, that's a new capability that I think you'll enjoy. Uh, of course, then you want to be able to trace to things, and we've, we've really improved the traceability spider diagram. Uh, it allows you to link things together and create resources within the diagram. I'm sorry, create links within the diagram between things. So you can create those relationships right there. And again, it's fully sidebar enabled as well. A new thing we added was a 3D traceability to compare different hierarchies. 
Uh, it lets you take a maybe a physical and functional and see how they're related to one another. So you can make sure that that, that you have the relationships you want or you can take your requirements hierarchy and tie it against something else, the physical or functional. Uh, so those kinds of things can be can be done. Uh, when you when you uh, have a good connections, you'll see the, the yellow lines and uh, between the two points, the two hierarchies, one's in blue, one the other's in purple. Uh, but if you see one missing that's not connected, it'll show up as a little red dot, which maybe you can see on the, the left. Is, this is almost like looking for a star, <laughs> which is why the, being able to rotate this in three dimensions is very valuable. Uh, it lets you do that. Again, if you click on one of these nodes, uh, one of the blue dots or the or the uh, purple dots or the red dot, it will take you right to that entity view of it. So you can work with it there too. Um, cross view real time collaboration. Okay, this this has been upgraded significantly. We have group chat now, uh, which everybody was asking for. So yep, sure enough. And and project notifications. Okay, so when people change things, we you, we it'll send you an email if you subscribe to it. Uh, if you look at the carefully at the um, uh, at this diagram, there's a J in the corner and a C. And those are showing that we've got two people looking at 1.7 and 1.10. So we have other people looking at those because, I, I, and they may be in a totally different view, but they're looking at that entity. And so we know that by this, by this uh, indicator. So that's another, again, big change, upgrade that I think you'll like. Um, we have tile view. They finally brought back tile view for me. Uh, this is another way to look at the database again with pictures. So again, if you're if you're kind of pictorially oriented, like I am, uh, then, then you like to have the pictures to work with as well and show people. And again, sometimes that can be nice. Uh, one of the tricks I do with this uh, that that I like to, uh, to try is I'll take uh, pictures of like a, a document cover and put those in as a picture for, for an artifact, uh, things like that. You can go through and, and then visually see things very rapidly that way. Uh, for those who are interested in the DOD architecture framework, and frankly, if you're doing government work, uh, that may become all of you very soon. Uh, if you haven't heard about the DODAF is migrating to something called the unified architecture framework, and that is going to be bringing together all these other architecture frameworks from around the community, including the uh, what NATO and uh, MOD, the British one. So, so it's bringing all those together, and, and, but DODAF will be the basis of it. Uh, so DODAF 2.02 is the current version. Uh, we've created a whole special dashboard for DODAF, and that, that became obvious that you needed to do that because now you want to be able to pick products and create them or edit them. And as you as you create products, the list in the edit will keep showing up. So I think you'll see uh, in this, if you look at the CV1, for example, here, we're showing create new one. That's, that's if you want to create a new one. Or you can edit overall vision, which is the document that, that's already been created. So this gets you, again, visibility into your DODAF products. Uh, we also convert the statistics from the statistics model you saw on the regular dashboard into DM2 statistics, which in case you're not familiar, DM2 is the DODAF meta model 2.0. That's the, that's the schema they've, they've come together with uh, at DOD for this. So uh, one of the things we do, we have, an, we have a, a nice AV1 product, I'll show you in a second. And, but the AV2 product is this PES export and PES stands for physical exchange specification. That's a that's a DODAF thing which takes and, and converts this information about the different schema into an XML file output. Now that by the way that is becoming more and more important as I understand because uh, people are starting to write tools that will read that file and do analysis on it. So there is there is some there is something for that. Uh, here's the AV1 I mentioned, and this goes into a new thing called document view. And I'm, I think I have another slide on that a little bit later. But what that does is now 
you can deal with this as if you were in uh, a word processing application. You can embed tables, you can, you can bold, you can italicize, you can do all the things you'd like to do in terms of having a basic kind of document. I mean, it's obviously not Microsoft Word. We're not trying to compete with Microsoft Word. The output, in fact, is a, if you write the, send the, get the report for this, that is in Microsoft Word format. So the ultimate document needs to go to Word. Um, but what this does is let you create the document and then link it to other things within the within the database. Things like risk and decisions. You know, these are important things you want to track as you're going through your project. Uh, I remember working on one project where we did the AV one, and uh, I was in charge of it. And I and and I asked for people for the findings section, which is section eight, and and I, then I asked them, well, so what architecture product uh, brought you that finding? They couldn't tell me. <laughs> so, so you can imagine why having that traceability would be important. I made them go back and dig it up. It probably took them hours, <laughs> each one of them to do it. But, uh, but that's what we, you know, that's what people want to know. They want to know why did the architecture tell me I have this finding? Because that's the first thing a senior is going to ask on it. Anyway, I belabored that one enough. Uh, we also have added in this the uh, matrices. So we have matrices set up. Uh, I will tell you, this is this is probably a little dangerous in the sense that you are creating relationships when you click these X's. And so you want to make sure you know what which ones you really want to tie with the others. Uh, it can it can do some funny things, to your hierarchy diagrams and things like that. So so this is uh, supposed to be a reflection. Uh, so it may be better for you to do the analysis and allocations directly in entity view or in one of the other views and then look at the matrix and see what see what comes out. Um, just that's a kind of lesson learned as we were working with it. Um, by the way, also DODAF has a lot of timelines. We have a timeline view uh, that, that still works very well from 2.0. So so that's that's a lot of the other products that are in DODAF. Um, okay, so probably one of the biggest ahas we had in doing this was we said, okay, model-based systems engineering is the rage. Everybody says, oh, you got to do model-based systems engineering. This is great. But, you know, I've been in the world of proposals and, you know, when you have to create an RFP, uh, request for a proposal, uh, maybe uh, from the government side or from the contractor side for subcontractors, you have to create these things. And what that is, is an actual document. It's a legal document, and it needs to have a lot of words in it. It needs to be mostly prose. You can have some pictures, but you probably can't easily hand them a physical or functional model and have them fully understand it. So you want to spend some time writing a specification. But the problem is, or, or you know, a requirements document, whatever, yeah, specification. So, so the problem is, is how do I go from the model to the specification? Well, we've solved that for you. We go through and read the different parts of the model and, and, and then create the specification from it. Okay, now that's a rough draft specification, obviously, and you're gonna add to it and do more with it, but it's a place to start. As you change, the, when you change the model, you can update this as well and have it not mess up your, your changes. So. So it, 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 is a, it is set up now as a round robin kind of capability in terms of the tool. I, I think that's gonna be a big difference for making model-based system engineering really work for people because now you can get your spec as well. And now, now you're gonna make your contracts people happy, you're gonna make your managers happy and all, a lot of your other stakeholders. Uh, so I mentioned documents view now a couple times. Uh, it's a very simple process. Uh, any, of the, any of the templates, in fact, are set up to, to go right into documents view. One of them is the CONOPS, the concept of operations. So you can go up and select that. You select what type. We have different templates, depending on what you want, with and without guidelines to help you uh, work through it. Uh, the two for CONOPS we have is the Applied Space Systems Engineering book uh, and then the uh, Defense um, Acquisition University as well. Uh, so, so you can look at both of those. Uh, and of course, you can bring in your own template and create it in, in documents view and, and work with it there as well. So nothing prevents that. 
And if you've got some really good templates you'd like us to add, you think we should add, please let us know. Uh, we'd love to, we would love to put that in. Okay, so next step, uh, before we go to the next steps here, maybe let's go to uh, the actual live video here. So <laughs> I'm gonna switch to you and talk to you, show you the different parts of the tool uh, as well here in real time. So I wanna leave enough time for you to have plenty of time for questions. So you, you, you enter in to InnoSlate at InnoSlate.com. Uh, you, you can sign in or if you're new, just type in your email address my email. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and it, it has to be a real email. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Patients.com. And and then you, you just hit sign up for free. And then what it does is send you a confirming email, which you will have to go through and and say yes to. Okay, and, and there's like two or few other little questions that get asked, but that's it. So it's that easy to sign up. And so go sign up today, it's free. Try it as long as you want. Um, it The only limitation it has is you're limited to 200 entities. Okay, unless you're an academic, if you have a .edu, it limits you to 2,000. So if you're using it, you want to use it in classes and use your coursework, your graduate work, uh, please feel free to do so. Okay, then you'd hit sign in and it would basically take you to your project and here would be a new project kind of view. You, here's your dashboard. Now it's not very exciting here because we have nothing in it. <laughs> so how do we get it started? We click on what, we, what we're interested in, architecture, functional analysis, or full lifecycle management. Let me pick that one because it shows you all of them and shows you all the different things you can do. Create a new requirements document. That, that's starting one from scratch. Let's say you just want to create a requirements document. You click that and you go right into it. Um, import an existing one. There's a, another place you can do import. Uh, you don't have to go to the import analyzer. You can do it right from here. Uh, we also have a sample problem to, to import and a white paper on it. So. We have that pretty much doc, that kind of documentation and import capabilities all the way through the, this, uh, this, pro, this project. So you can see the different opportunities that are available to you. Um, so let's look at a project that's a little bit farther along. Okay, it's a lot farther along. <laughs> and give you an idea of what that looks like. By the way, if you don't like this thing, you can always uh, go back to this or you can dismiss it completely, so you don't have to look at that if it bothers you. Uh, we've done that through all this, and you can, if you get you want to get it back, you go to settings, and so show start panel, okay? And there it is, again, so, and I then can dismiss the settings. So you can see all this is in, online, in line, and easy to use, very quick. Uh, we've taken that this philosophy all through the tool. Um, again, here's your notifications. Uh, we keep getting people throwing in new actions and junk, so that's showing me deleting it. <laughs> uh, something I didn't mention was the model maturity checker. And this is actually an algorithm given to us by uh, professors at um, and, and students at uh, Stevens Institute of Technology. Uh, Kristen Giamarco uh, particularly is the professor who, who spearheaded this. And what it does is it looks for these different things about the, um, it, well, and in fact, let me show you the results of it. So you can see when you run it, it, it shows you the different axioms that are here and, you know, why it failed. And so you can go through and, and, and fix that, um, you know, or, or you can disagree with it. You say, like, no actions shall have more than seven children. Um, well, is that really a hard and fast rule? IDEF had six as a limit, but you know that's that's something you can decide is good enough or not. But unless you, at least you can see it and you can understand what the different uh, aspects of it are. So, um, and then the statistics piece. So, again, this shows you that where you're over hovering over, and shows you how many. And 
<laughs> a lot unlabeled. What a surprise. That's going to be. But here's the ones that are the systems. So I can see how many systems I've identified uh, with that with that label. Test proctor. Tester. So you can, I think you can see the kind of thing you're looking at. We don't have anything. We have 44 entities in time, but nothing labeled. So And so you see statement, statement only. Okay, that statement refers to both statements and requirements. The second one, the second one is statements only. And again, you see how many derived requirements you have, things like that. So this is, again, useful information for you to understand and work with and manage the project. And that's the purpose. Okay, so fre frequently then you're going to uh, import a document uh, and get into the uh, requirements mode. So here's the new requirements look. Uh, we've added rationale uh, to the to the requirement. That's an, that is an automatic attribute now. Um, you can see if you look closely, there's a little green T, and that says it's been traced. And it has a traces to relationship identified. You can also have an S for satisfied by. And so th those will show up as different p options for you. Um, again, late, you can see the labels, the labeling we all had before. Um, if you want to report on this, the reports now are all in line. So just click the report button and come up and, and say what kind of document you want. And right now, on this one, we only have a basic document, but we can load in others as we go. Um, so cancel that. So th that's that's kind of a new feature in in across the board in almost all the views. Um, so let's go on and take another look at another one. Uh, so here's our updated action diagram. These are resources now, as I said. So in fact, it means I probably don't need to have as many uh, input output entities because I was kind of pretending that those were input outputs Well, those are really resources now I can use it in the resource modeling in the simulation and so you click on it and see the information showing up on the left hand side notice we also have the metadata for that here now okay and of course you could always go to the existing tab and get existing things to add into this to drag in so if you want to do your branch allocation, you just drag the asset to the branch, and that will show you what it, what it goes to. So again, you get to select which one. Um, another thing, again, I mentioned was the sequence diagram. Here's a sequence diagram for this particular problem. Uh, it works well with, with the action diagram. Uh, we recommend you stay with the default mode right now. Uh, we're working on an experimental, uh, doing it by um, in, by uh, in parallel. So that's kind of an interesting thing to play with if you're academically interested, but uh, uh, it's, it's, it is a little dangerous. <laughs> it can give you some, some, some results you don't want. Uh, but we're constantly trying to innovate and find new ways to do things. Another th diagram that I personally happen to like a lot is this tree diagram. Uh, this is another way to do, instead of a, a standard hierarchy diagram, it's a, it's a tree and you can Go, go out the tree. You can also add new nodes to the tree right here. So you can see how you can interact with it. The hierarchy diagram is interactable as well, by the way. So, so we did upgrade that as, to the same paradigm. Um, asset diagram, again, I said that that's, this is kind of a n nice look at, at it. It's, uh, it's been fixed a, a number of different things to make it look a little prettier. Uh, particularly your, your lettering and things like that look much better. And then, of course, you can add backgrounds now. That's a new feature. If you look down at the bottom corner, you see change background. That's where you add in a, a background picture. And then uh, here's what the, um, uh, when, you, when you go ahead and create a specification, it automatically puts you into requirements view, not document view. And the purpose for that is then now you can treat your specification as if it was a real requirements document. You have all the features of the quality check, baselining, all the other capabilities you really want for managing this specification. Because this is probably one of the most important outputs you're going to have from the tool. And so this, this had, because since it has legal imp implications, and notice it automatically gives it a derived label. And of course, you can add additional labels for yourself as you go through. 
I did a quick check and it, it, it got started and it's certainly not a, a full, complete, uh, high quality requirement, but that's okay. That's, that's what you want to know is how, how much can I get in the starting point for this? Okay. Well, that's the, that's the major, uh, things I had. Uh, so let me go back to, let's finish up here. Um, so, so, uh, please sign up for free. Um, on Insulate.com, like we just showed you. Uh, Kickstart yourself using the, the panel dashboard. You, you, we have lots of documentation. We're continuing to update the documentation. So uh, if you have any particular questions or trouble, just call our support line or email our support line or chat. Uh, they're available uh, during the normal work day on the Eastern Seaboard. Um, and uh, provide us feedback with the feedback panel. I, I guess I forgot to show that part. In the, in the dashboards, there is now a, a feedback panel that says send feedback. So you can type in your message down here and, and, and uh, if you send this message, our guys will really like it a lot. <laughs> okay, so the, and, and, and this is a new thing. Uh, we, we, had, we had a thing called Feature Tracker uh, in version 1 and 2. Uh, this is really a substitute for that, although we still have Feature Tracker out there and available for people as well. So, um, okay. Well, we finished a little early, which is good in my mind. I, I'm giving you back uh, 15 minutes or uh, 13 minutes of your day. <laughs> uh, if you, again, if you have any other questions, please let us know. We're happy to, to support in any way we can. Thank you.